Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us this lunchtime. So whilst you're all settling in, I'm going to pop a short video on to set the scene for this afternoon. I'll pop that on and we'll be back with you in a couple of minutes. The creation of HS2 is the biggest infrastructure project in Europe. The first new intercity railway to be built north of London in over a century. HS2 is being built in two phases. Phase 1 will link London and the West Midlands and is due to be completed by 2026. In Phase 2, the line will extend to Crewe by 2027 and followed by new lines towards Manchester and Leeds by 2033. But before we build bridges, tunnels, tracks and stations, an unprecedented amount of archaeological work will take place along the line of the route. HS2's archaeology programme is the largest ever undertaken in the UK. This once-in-a-generation opportunity allows us to reveal over 10,000 years of British history. Come with us as we take a train through time. Our journey starts a long time ago in the Paleolithic period, where early ancestors roamed in groups hunting and gathering food, then settled and learned how to farm and discovered the secrets of making bronze and iron. We will then travel forward in time to see the mark the Romans left on Britain. From their straight roads and new systems of government to sanitation and town planning. Following the departure of the Romans, we head into medieval Britain. We'll see the effect the Black Death had on villages, towns and cities and gain insight into how critical battles in the Wars of the Roses unfolded. The final leg of our journey takes us to the Industrial Revolution, where the landscape and infrastructure of Britain saw dramatic changes. Factories were built and the economy grew. In the 19th century, the steam rail network revolutionised how we moved goods and people across the country. In the 21st century, HS2 gives us a chance to do so again, creating a fairer, more balanced and prosperous Britain. Using the skills and expertise of an unprecedented number of archaeologists, all artefacts and human remains will be treated with the dignity, care and respect they deserve. And all discoveries will be shared with communities, retelling the stories of our past, helping us understand what made us as a country. The sheer scale of possible discoveries, the geographical span and the vast range of our history to be unearthed makes HS2's archaeology programme a unique opportunity to tell the story of Britain whilst leaving a lasting legacy for generations to come. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Sam Fieldhouse. I'm Community and Education Manager for Wessex Archaeology. You can see me in the middle there on that slide. In a few minutes, I'll be joined by various colleagues to discuss new archaeological finds around Colesville. Your team this afternoon will be joined by Mike and Helen from HS2, and you've got myself and Emma from Wessex Archaeology. Now we're going to start with an introduction from Helen, and Helen is going to tell us a little more about the breadth and extent of the archaeology of HS2. Helen, over to you. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Uh, those of you who saw the animation will see that we have a massive opportunity to understand the story of our nation between London and Birmingham. And during the largest ever investigation programme ever in the UK, we're going to be having well over a thousand archaeologists and specialists excavating the range of sites that you can see on the map before you. And they will be uncovering thousands and thousands of years of our history. And there'll be well over 60 sites. Some will only last a couple of weeks. Some will last several months. And you're going to hear about Coles Hill today again from, from Emma in a moment. But you can see from that map that we actually have a transect across our landscape. And that is very much a unique opportunity for us to tell the story of our nation's heritage. So with that, I will hand you over to Emma to talk to you about Colesville. 
Brilliant. Good afternoon and thank you all for taking the time today to watch this webinar. I'm Emma Carter and I'm a commercial archaeologist for Wessex Archaeology. Now the first time I set foot on site at Coleshill was nearly three years ago where I was co-supervising trial trenching from Burton Green to Coleshill Manor. And it was also Wessex Archaeology's first trenching site for HS2. During the excavations we had to relocate a trench and I decided that we need to squeeze in on the crest of a hill um, in, in the same sort of area. Now, the trench revealed a dark grey curving gully with a piece of Roman pottery just peeking through the surface. Further excavations revealed that the curved gully was part of an enclosure, and we will go on to find two beautiful Roman brooch fragments. Little did I know then what amazing discoveries would be made in this landscape rich in archaeology, and how our, our excavations here would uncover features from prehistory all the way through to the 19th century. So the majority of our archaeological excavations to date have taken place to the east of Birmingham at Stonely, Coleshill, Water Orton, First Green and Ricknell Street to name a few. So you might recognise some of those names if you live in those areas. So these excavations have revealed some amazing insights into the past, from ancient burials to marvellous moats and manor houses, we're really starting to build a greater insight through this corridor of land as to what life was like through the ages. So I'd like to take you through some of our highlights of our work so far and later we'll see how even the smallest artifact can tell us big things about the past. But how do we gather that information to begin with? Excavations of features used to be limited to trowels, a notebook and perhaps even the odd paintbrush but if you come to one of our sites today you'll see that digital recording has completely changed the way we undertake this task. So we use UAV drones to capture a record of the site from the sky and the images it then produces can be 3D rendered, which will reveal nuances in the landscape that we might not have been able to see on the ground. So a view from above can often give us a better perspective. And in a moment, I'm going to show you some drone footage from the Colson Mitigation site. And we'll be looking at three distinctive feature groups. So a little bit more about those groups first of all. So the first thing we're going to look at will be a pit alignment. So a pit alignment is a series of pits in a row that help form a boundary or marker. So little is known about their function and significance, but they are believed to be related to a division of the agricultural and political landscape. And the next thing we'll look at will be roundhouses. So some of you might be familiar with them. Roundhouses are a circular style house with a strong pointed thatch roof, and the walls can be made of materials like cob, which is compacted mud, or even perhaps stone. They range in date from the Bronze Age, Iron Age, and through to Sub-Roman periods, However, you may recognise them as they have, the design has been given a lease of life by modern eco-conscious architects today. So when we see roundhouses, they're easily identifiable through our excavations from the round gully that, that they leave behind. Moving on lastly to enclosures. Enclosures are really exciting. They can do so many different things and they can be any shape and they can use things like ditches, banks, or even perhaps fencing to separate one area of land from another. Enclosures can be used around cemeteries, domestic dwellings, uh, even animals. They can be places of ritual and even fortification. Okay, so if you've not had the chance to visit an archaeological dig before, you may find it hard to pick out these features. So do look for the dark shadows on the ground that mark out our excavation slots and try to spot the changes in colour so from the sandy red colour natural to the light grey or brown blobs. So those blobs are actually in fact archaeology. So as the video is playing, I will talk through the features, but I'm going to close my webcam so you can see the full image. So I'll just hand this over to you now, Sam. Thanks, Emma. And while that's loading, I just want to say to remember that this video footage was captured before the current COVID-19 situation. We'll be talking a little bit about COVID-19 and archaeology later on. You may also just want to turn your volume up whilst we look at this footage. So here is our drone flying over our backfill trenches from the previous evaluation and we'll move up in a moment to show the two areas that we'll be discussing. So the M6 there above us and then on the left that's our that white area with all those boxes that's our compound and that brown swish coming down delineates our two mitigation areas that we'll be discussing. And you might be able to pick out as we move over now from an overhead shot our two roundhouses then a line going down the middle and that's our pit alignment. So by roundhouse, if you look to the bottom left corner, see that big circle, that was one of our roundhouses. 
So we just want to get your eye in for the Roman enclosure. As we swoop over this, you can pick out that kind of white corner. If you follow that white corner around, that's actually the Roman enclosure. And now if you look for all these kind of darker shadows, that's all where we've dug slots in the ground to identify the type of archaeology. We're panning up now to a lovely shot of the roundhouse. And so my colleagues are now going to help by standing in the features just to show us what they actually look like on the ground. It has quite a big impact, doesn't it? So we can see all those holes that they're standing in. They're excavated features that we've dug up to understand more about what's going on. And a really impactful shot there of the Roman enclosure. So you can appreciate the angularity of it in comparison to perhaps the roundhouses and the pit alignment here. So you can see my colleagues standing in the circle and now in that big kind of angular part of the rectangle and back to the pit alignment and in the middle there you might be to pick out the roundhouse. So you can see that the pit alignment travels down and that the roundhouses are within that boundary marker. It shows just what a big impact it would have on the landscape I think. Imagine that, you know, a 200 long metre pit alignment. It really shows who owns the area and who owns what. And you look at that there with the wonderful Roman enclosure, absolutely ignores any kind of alignment that the other features have from the Iron Age. The Romans just plonked it on there and decided that that's theirs. So my colleagues are now walking off into the distance. I think they've done a good job showing us the archaeology. So let's discuss it more. Brilliant. So we will start off with the oldest or earliest features on site. So this is a survey map of the archaeology we've just seen. You can hopefully pick out the two light blue circles, which are the roundhouses, and then this big pink line with blue bits in it. The pink is the archaeology and the blue are the excavation slots. The, the pit alignment runs broadly on a northwest southeast axis and we have very little dating from it, just one piece of pottery. And from these pits, we do have a suspect that it's Iron Age. So the Iron Age runs from 800 BC to 43 AD. And these pits, uh, pit alignments, we've seen similar characteristics on other sites in the landscape, and that's how it gives us that dating. So we think that the pit alignment here is actually the same one that we found 300 meters to the north, and that the line of circles that you can see in this slide are also pits. So we can see that the pits are on the same northwest southeast axis as it continues down through the site to our roundhouses. So these pits next to the C-shaped roundhouse were here first and may have been marking out boundaries of land ownership or perhaps agricultural pasture. So you can see that the pits are obscured by the ditch. So you've got the pits coming down there and the ditch that runs over it. And the ditch follows the same direction of the pits down to the roundhouses and enclosing them and then continues down to the southeast. So that ditch also has further spurs coming off of it, dividing up the land into field systems similar to what we see today in the countryside. So if you go out for a walk you might notice that the farmer's field is parcelized either by uh, a ditch system or it might have hedgerows or it might even have some stone walls. So it's exactly the same type of thing, just we're looking at it from the Iron Age period. Because the fill system overlies the pits, we know that it came later. So just these two feature groups alone, we're already starting to build a story of landscape management becoming more and more sophisticated. So where can we place the roundhouses in this? So slots through the ditch here have shown a distinctive tipping fill made up of stones that have been in a fire. So a tipping fill is something that you or I can easily recreate. If I'm in the garden, I've got all my garden waste, I've got it perhaps in a bucket, I need to get rid of that waste. I would tip it in a perhaps a compost bin. But if looking back into the Iron Age period, bins, you're not going to use that, are you? So you often dig a pit and you chuck your rubbish in there or you would chuck it in your nearby ditch. So that's what a tipping fill is. So within this tipping fill, they've got the stones that have been affected by a fire. And we, can, we know this for a fact because the stones have a dark rosy bloom or a very, very deep bruised red colour and they've got veins and cracks and breaks from the heat across them. That's really significant that shows that those stones have been in a fire. So the tipping fill also has other heat affected material like charcoal. And we found this type of fill in the foundation of the roundhouse as well as the ditch. So this type of fill is deliberate and it's also made by humans. So by finding two similar deposits in two features that close 
could suggest that they were actually contemporary to one another. So this shows that the next phase of development in the land, originally the pit showed the first sign of marking out boundaries and land use, and then perhaps the people become more settled, more sophisticated ways of carving out agricultural land use developed, as did a need for a place to sleep. So the roundhouses are also likely to be from the same period as the pits, so the Iron Age, just later. Now, one of the things we are investigating is whether these roundhouses were occupied all the time or just seasonally, and when and why did they fall out of use? So this question is really important about seasonal occupation or permanent occupation in the area. If you can imagine living in a landscape, you're quite exposed to the elements. So during the winter months when your crops really aren't yielding, it's going to be quite cold, it's going to be rainy, it's definitely going to be muddy. So you may wish to consider moving somewhere else. However, if you've decided that's going to be your permanent place or your permanent settlement, you're going to really start to invest in that landscape. You might look at water management and things like that to make your life a little bit easier. So that's why the question of permanent settlement is just so important for us. So moving on lastly to our large rectangular enclosure, we saw the big wide ditch in the drone footage, but what we might have missed out was a smaller gully running parallel to the outside. Now, the rectangular enclosure is on a completely different alignment to the pits and roundhouses. And it's also very distinctive with strong straight lines and almost perfect right angles. So it's nothing at all like the undulating outlines of the roundhouses. We can also see that it's crossing over the pit alignment that comes diagonally through the landscape. So the enclosure ditches can be seen cutting through or overlying those pits. So we know that this enclosure is then the most recent. So much like with other features in this area, dating through finds is very, very sparse. So in our evaluation, we found one single piece of Roman pottery in the bigger ditch, which does help us date it, but also the angularity and the straight lines of the ditch further suggest an uh, Romano-British state. Now, what was it used for? So we did wonder if it might be the footprint of some sort of structure because it's just so straight. Now, there's a brilliant site nearby called Grimstock Hill. I do urge you to give that a bit of a Google and check it out. It's a brilliant site. Now, in the excavations at Grimstock Hill, they found a double ditched enclosure, and that was actually the site of a Roman temple. So we also have a double ditch. So could this too be a temple? In short, it is unlikely. And in the same way that we can compare the pit alignments to similar feature types across the region, we can also look at similar characteristics of enclosures in, compar in comparison to our one here. So another current idea is that it's potentially a Roman marching camp. Now, if it is a marching camp, we would expect to find quite a lot of um, artifacts and sort of rubbish left over from those troops of Romans. Um, so at present, it is still too early to tell that, but we have found a very, very nice piece of charcoal. So the charcoal is actually about this big, and because it's that size, we'll actually be able to do radi radiocarbon dating on it as well as doing wood species identification. So as I mentioned, finds are sparse on this site, but we do have some fantastic pieces to show you in just a moment. So we are going to look at some of the finds from Coles Hill with the aid of our brilliant 3D modeler, and also Sam is gonna do it for us. So again, I'm gonna switch off my webcam and throw you over to Sam, and we'll discuss some of our more exciting finds. Here's the first one, Emma. Oh, wonderful. So um, this image is made from getting one of our artefacts and taking hundreds and hundreds of photographs and then rendering it all into one composite image to give you this 3D virtual find. And as you can see, the detail there is oh, it's pretty exciting, isn't it? So let's get on with it. So this is a possible harness fitting with a fleur-de-lis pattern visible on the raised central knob. So a central knob is this kind of a hump or bump and you'll hear me repeat that word uh, for later fine descriptions. So on the outer decorated rim, there's a single hole made for a, ribbit, for a rivet, um, and it's also made from copper alloy. So this possible harness fitting is from the 19th century. I would have probably found adorning the harness components for a horse, so perhaps on the collar or, or in fact the bearing reins. Yeah, it's lovely. So we'll move on now to the next artifact. So this is actually quite a misleading artifact. It's probably one of my favorite ones to bring out and bring discussion through. So let's have a look at it. So the artifact is misleading because the form is so distinctive and recognizable. 
But when we see these sinuous snakes and serpents, we might think of Vikings or even barbarian tribes. So let's have a closer look. The artifact has two loops, so that means it's attached to something at each end, and it's also made out of copper alloy. But what do you think it is? So we're going to do a short poll, poll now to test your archaeological knowledge. So take a good look at that artifact, memorise what it looks like, and I will bring up a poll and we want you to all to vote to what you think this artefact might be. So you've got four options there. If you're viewing full screen, you might need to exit full screen so you can vote. And then get voting. Wow, you're all voting already. And Emma, I can tell you, opinions are very, very split. Nice. So Emma, the results as they stand, we have 36, it's an exact split. 36% of people think it's a partial helmet strap. 36% also think it's a furniture fitting, 6% feel it could be Viking jewellery, and 23% of our audience today are going through the sword embellishment. So Emma, who is correct? Well, I can reveal that this is actually in fact a 19th century fitting, which probably adorned a piece of furniture. Now, I don't think that diminishes its value in any way, because I think this is really exciting and shows that perhaps the Victorians were trying to evoke a, a pseudo-barbarian style to some of their furnitures. OK, so let's move on. And this next one, uh, loading there, fantastic. So this is a copper alloy Roman bow brooch, and it dates back to the first century AD. So the brooch fragment was found in part of the enclosure that kept livestock. So that's the same enclosure I mentioned about that grey curving gully at the start of the talk. The brooch has a rear facing hook on the back, as you can see there, lovely, and then a distinctive bow art shape on the front, which then wings out on each side. The intact side retains its decorative knob. Now these diagnostic indicators help us accurately categorise the style and where it was made. And from this, we know that the brooch is actually East Anglian. So it's actually travelled quite a distance to end up in, a, in an animal enclosure in the Midlands. So I think what I really like about this is there's a hidden story that's not yet been told about this artefact and where it's moved so far across the country. And it's poor so, owner who walked all that way, then dropped it. <laughs> yeah, it's quite unfortunate, isn't it? Um, so we'll move now on to the next one. Brilliant. So this Roman brooch was found in the same animal enclosure as the previous bow brooch, and this style is called a trumpet brooch, so named because of their open ends and tubes that look like trumpets. It's actually one of my favourite brooches that we've got off the site, because when you pick it up, it's just so heavy, and that's part of the characteristics of this style of trumpet brooch. So they're often heavy and highly decorated. So on this example, we can see that the bow head is a vertical oval in plan, then on the back, there is a vertical perforated lug where the pin would have attached. And one of the brilliant things about 3D rendering is that we can manipulate the image and have a look at it without damaging the de delicate composition of the artifact's material makeup. Brilliant. So I will pass you now over to Sam. Marvellous. Thank you very much indeed for that, Emma. So we're coming on to the the time now where we're going to be taking your questions. So some of you have been asking some questions already. If you have any questions, you'll have a box on your screen that looks a little bit like this one here. So in the box on your screen that looks just like that one, if you have any questions, now is the time to type them in. We've got Helen here, who is HS2 Head of Heritage. We've got Mike, who is HS2 Head of Archaeology. And of course, Emma and myself, so we will divvy up the questions as they come in. And I can see we've got a few questions coming in already. So the first question I'm probably going to pass to Helen. Uh, Helen, the first question we've got is about what happens to the artefacts that are found during the archaeology for HS2? Where are they going and what happens to them? Well, after the uh, archaeological specialists have done all their analysis to make sure that we get all the scientific and uh, social information out of the artefacts so we can tell the full story of the site, uh, we will be depositing them with a local museum. So Birmingham or Warwickshire, we're busy um, putting those strategies in place at the moment and talking to the museum. So hopefully in the future, it'll be several years yet, but in the future you'll be able to go and visit them in a local museum. 
and marvellous that answers someone else's question as well who was asking about where they'd be able to see the artifacts displayed so eventually local artifacts in local museums for you there yeah so that's right. marvellous thanks helen uh the next question um a few people helen are asking about how long excavations at coal Hill, but also route wide so how long is that archaeology going on for and when will people start to see a railway appearing um, well, I'm going to pass the archaeology dates and questions to Emma for Coles Hill and Mike for the larger route. But with regard to when the railway is um, going to open, then those dates are in the public domain. And I know the animation is a little bit out of date. It says 2026. But we have new dates for opening. And I think they are 2029 for phase one and then later for phase for phase two be up to Manchester. So. Um, I can't quite remember those dates, but if Mike or Emma want to talk specifically about the archaeology programme dates and Coles Hill, I'll pass over to them. That's great, Thanks, Mike. Helen. Yeah, can you tell us a bit more about archaeological dates on site at Coles Hill? Well, as Helen said, I think the Coles Hill works will be going on for the rest of this year, but across the whole of phase one, so that's the bit between London and Birmingham, uh, we'll probably be in the field for most of this year and a lot of next year. Uh, but of course that's not the end of the story um, once we come off site we spend uh, a number of years doing analysis uh, preparing all of the information interpreting all the finds in order that we can tell people about what we found thanks for that mike and emma a couple of people are concerned about the welfare of staff on site during the covid19 situation are you able to tell us a little bit about what it's like working on an archaeological site in these very strange times we're in at the moment Absolutely, yeah. So like you said, it is it is strange times for all of us. And uh, the way it's changed we work on site is uh, in some ways quite different. Um, so one of the biggest things for us is travelling to and from site. So um, we have to ensure now to, to maintain safe distance that it's one person per vehicle. Uh, we also ensure that when we're on site, we're not um, um, all in the sort of the, the tea room at the same time or in the lunch area. So we stagger our breaks to maintain that safe distance. When we're actually on site digging, as you see in the video, the coastal mitigation area is extremely vast, so we can easily maintain that two meter distancing. Now, when we do go, go back for our tea and lunch breaks, we have increased hygiene capacity as well. So that means uh, washing hands very, very regularly. When you go into a eating or messing area, as we call it, we ensure that that um, is fully cleaned down with antibacterial wipes. When you've eaten your lunch, you put that in the bin immediately and then you wipe down the area again and leave it. So the next person comes in and they do exactly the same thing. We also have um, hand washing stations throughout the compound area as well. So um, we also do uh, a revised risk assessment and we keep that up to date along with uh, Public Health England and government guidelines as well. So yeah, it's lots of safety measures, lots of hand washing, uh, lots of common sense and lots of adherence to what the government and Public Health England have said. Thanks, that, Emma. Now, a couple of people, uh, Sheila and SJ, are asked a similar question. So um, the question is, about, one of the questions is about what is mitigation? And the other part of this question is, what happens to the sites that are found? Uh, are they buried again? Are they removed? Uh, or will any sites be preserved as they are? I think, Mike, you might want to help us with that one. Of course, yes. Um, so with preservation, before we make a decision to um, investigate a site further, so that is the meaning of mitigation, um, before we make a decision to investigate a site, we look at all the options for whether or not we can preserve it in situ. And uh, unfortunately, if a site is located where we're going to be putting the railway, uh, it invariably can't be preserved in situ. So we do archeological excavation to make sure that we record all of the finds and all of the archeology span before we begin the construction of the railway. Marvellous, and that is then eventually that all that information is published in, in a report, isn't it? That's right, once we've done all of the, um, the excavations and all of the analyses in the lab, uh, we'll be publishing uh, all of the information for the public to, to, uh, to, to read. And Margaret, um, I hope that answers your question as well. Um, so we've got some questions. Emma, this is a good one for you. Uh, this is a question from Stuart. He's asking, what do the artefacts tell us about the day-to-day -day life of the people of Colesville 
all those years ago? Well, um, I think one of the most exciting things about day-to-day -day life at Coles Hill is that it is potentially represented in the Bronze Age period, Iron Age, Roman, Medieval, and then later early modern and 19th century. So um, in terms of the day-to-day -day life, from things like the um, grain analysis that we get from taking soil samples, we can say what the sediment might have smelt like. So there's um, a particular type of um, straw which kind of has this lovely kind of lemony scent to it. So one of our sites, we've got an abundance of that. So that suggests that there's this lovely kind of lemony hay bale smell coming through the settlement. Um, in terms of what their day-to-day -day life was like, there's some interesting questions at Coles Hill at how the Iron Age people interfaced with the Roman people. So we can see that when that um, Roman enclosure was just plonked on the landscape, those pit, that pit alignment wasn't developed any further. And it, we're in the very, very early stages of kind of having quite an interesting discussion about if there was kind of a, um, a, a melding of different landscape utilization ideas or if they were taken on more of the Roman way. So there's kind of a cultural mash that we're seeing in that area. Um, we need to do more analysis to give any further more concrete information, but I hope that's a good start. And uh, Emma, building on that, Barry is asking, uh, Barry says, did you find evidence of mammals on the site from the Iron Age? Yeah, so we'll, we've got, um, like I said, finds across the site are really, really sparse. That's potentially to do with the soil conditions or um, heavy agricultural ploughing from uh, the 20th century. But the couple of animal bones that we have retrieved are suggesting that they are um, slaughtering and butchering uh, animals nearby nearby the site. Um, another site, um, not actually on Coles Hill, but on a part of the route widened scheme, um, they've found uh, canine gnawing marks off fresh, freshly butchered animal bones. So it says they might actually be like feeding their their dogs some of the animal offcuts. So that kind of starts to build a life. But so it's only domestic animals that we've found so far. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. Now, a couple, some people are asking about uh, site visits and visiting sites. Obviously, we are tied to the COVID-19 situation at the moment. So if you do want to learn about visiting sites, keep an eye on all the commonplace websites, because that's when the first news will be made public about what we're arranging in terms of site visits. And obviously, that is completely dependent on the COVID situation. So I'm just looking through all the other questions there. There's Emma. This is a little bit off topic, but it's quite interesting. How did you become a professional archaeologist? I actually have a really strange route into archaeology, so bear with me. Um, I did a master's in English literature and fell in love with rare books and old stories. And I wasn't quite sure what to do with that passion. <laughs> and then um, Wessex Archaeology actually had a archival internship. And I thought there's nothing better than being stuck in this kind of wonderful ba basement with years worth of history just all around me so I romantically applied uh, to the position of thinking oh, I would be you know, the next Indiana Jones maybe and it was brilliant it was one of the best internships um, that I had the opportunity to enjoy um, that was six years ago now and I've kind of stuck with it um, so I've learned everything from being behind the scenes working in archives um, cataloging uh, the finds that we have marking them with accession numbers and then I got the chance to go out onto site and dig up a Iron Age settlement down south and that was just amazing and yes yeah, so that's basically my route in was kind of a, um, a happy accident and it's really a wonderful career. Thanks for that and Emma whilst we're with you Chris is asking um, some years ago a coin hoard and a temple were found in Colesville itself can we see any evidence yet linking our discoveries on site at Coles Hill to what was already known about in Coles Hill? That's a really, really good question. So um, once we finish digging on site, we go to the reporting side and that's where we'll look at, we'll bring in all that kind of additional documentary material and we'll link up our findings um, with other excavations to kind of push forward like the main research objectives. Now our excavations are led by the herds, which Helen could discuss a bit more, um, but the, the herds are basically a set of research directives that we aim to use to bring together all the pieces of history to actually produce something that is a contribution to our nation's heritage. Um, so at present, 
we're still digging on the site and when we go into the post excavation stage that's where we'll bring it in all together but yeah it's a really good question and uh, what, uh, this is coming from Margaret. Margaret is asking about burials um, on, on the site, but also along the line. Helen uh, or Mike, do you want to take that one? Shall I, shall I take this one? It's Helen. Um, yes, we've excavated uh, a series, uh, a number of human remains and burials along the route of uh, phase one. Perhaps the one that you'll have heard of most in the Birmingham area is the Park Street Cemetery, just in central Birmingham. We've also got a big post another post medieval cemetery uh, in just outside Euston. And we've also found some prehistoric and Roman uh, cremations up and down the route. Obviously, all human remains are dealt with all due dignity, care and respect. And we have very strict guidelines um, agreed with Historic England and the Church of England about analysis and reburial of uh, certainly in relation to the Christian burials um, with the Church of England about how people are treated. That's brilliant. Thank you, Helen. Uh, Rosie is asking, uh, are, when are we moving on to excavate the actual manor itself? He uh, Emma, you're probably best placed to answer this. I'm also really excited for that part of the excavation, Rosie, so thank you for your question. Um, so the, the medieval motive manor house, which you can actually see if you go onto Google Maps, you can see a very, very distinctive octagonal moat that's still in place. Um, we are hoping to proceed with that in late June, early July. Um, and then we'll be excavating, trying to find out how much of the manor house is still intact. And one of our current things we really want to look at is to what extent were the ornamental gardens in place as well? And also, is there anything that predates the moat? We'll also be looking at the effects of the Black Death on that manor house as well. So that's going to be really exciting. That, like I said, that will start in uh, June, July time. So not too far along. Thanks for that. Um, Mike, another one for you. Angela is asking. Uh, she says um, she says she's really enjoyed this. So thank you very much, Angela. It's good to know. Um, Angela would like to know, is there anywhere to find out about the archaeology along the rest of the route? Of course, yes. Um, if you go to our commonplace websites along along the line of route um, and uh, subscribe to those, it will give you all the information that we have on um, our works that are ongoing and any events that will be coming up will also be uh, advertised through there. That's brilliant. And that also answers Mike's question. Mike is asking, will you be doing a similar webinar for other sites in Warwickshire, perhaps around Stonely? Uh, Mike, yeah, absolutely. Keep an eye on Commonplace. Um, Stonely is on its way. Don't worry. So keep an eye on Commonplace to find out when that will be. And that is about it. Now, a number of people have asked some questions um, relating to ecology. Um, we don't have any ecologists uh, on our panel today so what I will do um, um, people like Ian you've asked about that uh, Barry you've also asked some questions um, that will need a more in-depth answer so what I'll do is using the email address that you signed up with for this webinar today I'll refer those questions to the relevant experts who will reply to you directly because they'll be able to give you a more in-depth response than we can today so thank you so much everyone for coming along today it's been lovely that so many we've had 111 people on this session today so it's really really great that so many have made the time to come along on the screen now you can see a survey we're really keen to get survey for these events because we want to know that we're doing the best we can to get information out to people locally within the area you'll also receive a follow-up email and in that email there will be a link to this survey so please do fill in that form uh, to help us understand how we can best share exciting archaeology stories and updates with you. So thank you all so much for attending. It's been really good. Stay safe and I'm sure we'll see you at future webinars. Thank you very much indeed. Goodbye.